only about 54,000 calories stored in muscle. And only half of that 54,000 calories is available for energy because once you've lost half of the protein in your body, it's no longer compatible with life. Simply speaking, when your body consumes half your muscle cells, the game is up. But a brain desperate for fuel holds nothing sacred. It will even sanction burning heart muscle to keep itself going. So you have to start eating the protein in your body, literally eating it up to produce the sugar that's needed by the brain and the red blood cell. Miraculously for Jean-Luc, his brain's high-risk strategy pays off. 35 days after he was tracked, searchers find him only 200 yards from the cave mouth. His ordeal cost him over 40 pounds in fat and muscle, but his brain is just fine. Now that I look back at it, I think that everyone has a survival instinct, but it's just when one faces a situation like this that one really discovers it. The brain has developed many ingenious ways to keep us alive in emergencies. It has just as many ways to keep us going in everyday life. Especially if your day job is racing at nearly 200 miles an hour. flat out at all times, digesting reams of information, and never more than during a NASCAR race. The brain manages thousands of systems that keep us alive. And it has to do that faster than any computer could, processing an astonishing 100 trillion instructions every second. As any central processing unit does, the brain produces heat. Without cooling, our brain would overheat, its internal temperatures rising one degree every five minutes. Ten minutes without cooling causes disorientation. Twenty minutes can do permanent damage. And after 50 minutes, if the brain is 10 degrees too hot, you're dead. Because our brain manages everything else, its main duty is to protect itself. Few settings test the brain's cooling system more than the blast furnace world of a stock car race. A split second hesitation can cost you the race. So staying cool is key to keep your, you know, your brain cool and, and your blood cool. You know, it's no different than the engines you know, in our race cars. If we don't keep them cool, they overheat and they'll blow up eventually and you'll be out of the race. We won't blow up, but we don't run good when we're hot. The drivers are ready for 400 laps of white-knuckle all-out speed. On the track, the temperature already runs past 100 degrees. Inside those 850 horsepower beasts, it's even hotter drivers working in the strenuous environment he's generating heat himself just through the exercise of steering and braking and all that but then you have the added thing of the exhaust pipes generating heat into the floor pit so typically we see cockpit temperatures 125 to 140 degrees in such extremes our brain needs sophisticated ways to stay cool our body's cooling system works like a car's we've got an a radiator system that basically cools the water that's circulated through the engine. You got airflow which comes in the front of the car and circulates through the core of the radiator and you have airflow that then goes over the top of the castings and the rest of the engine to help cool it by air. A car cools itself with water. The brain uses blood which carries heat to the skin surface. As sweat evaporates, it cools the blood. The forehead and face are the best sites for cooling. They have many sweat glands and air can get at them. 
NASCAR drivers have fresh air piped through their helmets to enhance the cooling effect. The rest of the body is harder to cool. So if you're in a situation, say, driving a racing car, you have to wear protective clothing that's going to protect you in a crash or you're in a fire. Sweating in that situation is not really going to help you because it's just going to be absorbed into the clothing. Eventually, the surface of the clothing will, will be wet and that'll evaporate. As the laps roar by, sweat saturates the driver's suits. This keeps perspiration from evaporating. But even after 210 laps, when the car's interiors are baking hot, the drivers must still perform at their peak. Out there in a racetrack, you're, you're looking literally hitting your mark within six inches, you know, sometimes every time. Every time you go off in a corner at 200 miles an hour. So you really have to be focused on hitting your marks on the racetrack. And, and you can't do that if you're focused on, you know, how hot you are. We still don't know exactly how our brain maintains the correct temperature under such conditions. One controversial theory says it has an extra cooling method. The brain is such an important organ that there are various um, capabilities and facilities there to try and maintain its normal internal environment. There are those that would argue that we have a special system that allows us to have selective brain cooling. On the way to the heart, blood cooled by a sweating face and forehead runs close to arteries, beating the head. That lowers the temperature of blood bound for the brain. Considering the brain's 10,000 plus miles of blood vessels, this may be how the core stays at optimum temperature. After five hours and 600 miles, the drivers cross the line, still 100% focused. They can do that thanks to the brain's astonishing ability to stay cool, even in the swelter of a NASCAR race. One period when our brain is most active is when our body is at rest. While we sleep, our brain performs some of its most vital tasks. Kept too long from sleep, the brain will shut the body down, even when life itself is threatened. Of all that goes on in the human brain, the biggest mystery surrounds the time when we sleep. One surprise is that at night, your brain is as busy as during the day. The brain's first job is to put us to sleep. As night falls, a dot-sized gland in the brain triggers release of our natural sleeping pill, melatonin. Acting on our central nervous system, melatonin makes us drowsy. But as the body slows, the brain goes to work. Every night, it performs a tune-up. Brain cells that have worked all day shut down for repair. Chemicals clean up the byproducts of brain cell activity, and in some parts, new brain cells grow. Without this internal diagnostic and repair service, the brain couldn't maintain peak performance. If we stay awake too long, our brain knocks us out, no matter what the consequences. That's what happened to explorer David Hempelman Adams when he attempted a record-breaking solo balloon trip to the North Pole. David planned to sleep briefly at times during the 1,500-mile journey. 
but he didn't stick to his schedule. In the first couple of days, I was on top of the game, and you know the adrenaline was up. Um, you know, I'm not too bad for the first couple of days anyway. After 48 hours without sleep, the balloonist's thought center was the first to go. Going into the second, into the third day, I was making silly mistakes. Okay, what's the new track? When I would call up the control room, they would give me a track, and I'd repeat it f three or four times just to make sure. And they go, "No, no, no! What are you stupid? You know, it's this." And so, I, I, you realise you're 